انگریز اپنا لگان اور نیوز لانڈری اپنا ہفتہ کبھی نہ چھوڑتے ویلکم ٹو ارادا ایپیسوڈ آف ہفتہ ان اے ویک وی وی ہیو ٹیمز ان ہاؤ مینی اسٹیٹس ٹریولنگ سر رائٹ ناؤ منی وی ہیو پیپل ان کرناٹکا کیرلا تمل ناڈو دین وی ہیو ان آسام بہار اینڈ مہاراشٹر تنشکا از لیونگ Manisha is going to Kerala today. And we will be having people in Manipur as well. And yes. uh, probably Tripura. So you will see a really wide on-ground coverage on the News Laundry and the News Minute election coverage. And why it is unique is because it is non-sponsored, ad-free, powered by you. All our journalism is only funded by you. You will not see any ads, whether Sarkari ads or large corporate ads. journalism funded and powered by you so do top up our nl election funds i think about four funds have been topped up as we speak i'll give you the exact data by the end of this show but do top up our funds so that we have journalists covering this election from everywhere and hopefully my next election the news minute news laundry partnership should have at least two journalists in every state in fact raman sir has an ambitious plan of sending people to kashmir also right now Uh, I said, okay, let's see how much we can spend and save. But even as we speak, uh, the, another election show is just about over a lakh that is left. And our other, the Battleground States, the Gender Pool and ID of India funds are about halfway there. So I urge you to click on the link in the show notes below or go to newslawny.com or thenewswinner.com. Click on the election fund and contribute because... Journalism should be powered by the public, otherwise it can never serve the public. I say that all the time. I'm saying that yet again, and I'm starting with an appeal. And those of you who have contributed, thank you so much. We have, you know, about 12,000 to 14,000 people who have actively contributed to these funds. You know, we, we need 100,000, 200,000. So take your time, click on the link and contribute to journalism. So journalism remains a public service and doesn't become a tool in the hands of large corporations and governments that can afford to fund journalism. all the ads which there are many of full pages that you see these days on that note let me introduce the panel like i said manisha is traveling uh, so joining me in the studio is editor in chief raman kripal hello welcome raman sir and anand vardhan whose hello. law exam should be over by now yes yes so now you a judge no no are you a lawyer <laughs> then why are you taking exams <laughs> See, sir, I want instant gratification. I'm the I'm the Gen Z. I'm Instagram. <laughs> three But semesters left. <laughs> three semesters left, and after that, any of you want to sue us? Now bring it on. We'll have the top lawyer of the country on our team. We'll take <laughs> you to the cleaners. And joining us online are two very accomplished panelists, and we are thrilled that they could make the time for us. In fact, um, I think we've been trying to get Sohas sir on the show for a while. Is that right? Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. So, so Has Palshikar is joining us from Pune. Thank you for joining us, sir. My pleasure. So, those of you uh, who may want an introduction, although he doesn't really need one, he taught political science at Savitra Bai Phule University. Uh, he is the chief editor of the journal Studies in Indian Politics, and he also uh, the co-director of Lok Niti Program on Comparative Democracy (CSDS). And we have quoted many of their reports, etc., on this show several times in the past year. So uh, that is Suhas Palshikar. Welcome, sir. Also joining us on Zoom uh, is Madhav Desh Pandey. Hi, Madhav. Hi. Namaste. Namaste. Are you joining us from Bangalore or elsewhere? No, I'm joining you from Pune. From Pune. You're also in Pune. Okay. So you're a computer industry veteran, a technical expert with four decades of experience in the field. You are the CEO of Tulip Software. You have consulted with the U.S. government on projects during the Obama administration, and your piece. on uh, the dis- possible design deficiency or just critiquing or uh, uh, looking at the design of evm machines called election commission's facts on evms don't really address major design deficiencies is available on the link in the show notes below it appeared in the wire and uh, we shall discuss the whole election uh, the e- election voting machines a uh, design with him and as many of you know it is being heard in the supreme court in fact yesterday was the It's an day. ongoing thing. So Today there was no, no decision has been taken as yet. But it was yesterday we were recording this on the Thursday, 18th of April at 3:21 p.m. and on Wednesday there was one hearing on this. Mm-hmm. I don't know when the next one is due. So thank you all for joining. And since Manisha isn't here, the headlines is my responsibility and duty today. Uh, so here are the headlines. 
So by the time you hear this episode, citizens from 102 constituencies would have voted in the first phase of the 2024 Lok Sabha election, which is scheduled for Friday, April 19th, uh, which is tomorrow. Tamil Nadu, which has 39 seats, votes in the first phase. Right. Then the Supreme Court on Tuesday dismissed criticism of voting through the electronic voting machines and said that attempts should not be made to, quote, bring down the system, unquote. A bench comprising Justices Sanjeev Khanna and Deepankar Datta also said that the electronic pro process in India was a humongous task and rejected suggestions by petitioners to order a return to ballot papers and polling. This case is still being heard. We have an area ah. expert on this. Uh, so we'll be talking to Madhav uh, on this dismissal issue. doesn't mean ki it is decisive. Right. The decision is yet to come. The decision is yet to come. Ah. It's still it's, it's ah. going to be heard. Then the Bharatiya Janta Party on Sunday launched its manifesto for the Lok Sabha elections, promising to hold simultaneous elections in Lok Sabha and state assemblies, the one nation, one election promise and the implementation of uniform civil code across India, among other promises. And we have two experts uh, to talk about this manifesto. So today we have a really fantastic panel for you. Then 29 alleged Maoists were killed and three security personnel injured in the gunfight in Chhattisgarh's Kankade district on Tuesday. Uh, this also was got made got a lot of media uh and i mean i don't know if it's practical go and actually send someone to get an on ground all report media there. stories have are fed they are not from the ground yeah, say, so we have not any report all from media the ground. stories yeah, so we haven't got any report on the ground for this and i was just wondering that something so big should be investigated from the ground but it hasn't happened mm -hmm. so far then former nagpur university professor shoma sen was released on wednesday after being granted bail by the supreme court in the elgar parishad case this happened on the 5th of April, uh, her bail. This happened six years after she was arrested by the Pune police. Six years she was inside without conviction. Our uh, justice. Then the election commission on Monday said it has seized cash, liquor, drugs, precious metals and other freebies or incentives <laughs> worth rupees 4,650 crore since the 1st of March. is the highest ever amount in the history of Lok Sabha polls. Why do you ask Black money to eradicate ho gaya tha. Demonetization. Bilkul. Pachas den diye jai mitro madhe. Pachas den aur jo sada desh bola ga. Mene sirap desh se pachas din maange hai. Pachas din. Tis december tak mujhe moka dijiye mere bhaiyo mein. Agar tis december ke baad koi meri kami rah jai. Koi meri galti ni kar jai. कोई मेरा गलत इरादा निकल जाए आप जिस चौराहे में मुझे खड़ा करेंगे मैं खड़ा होकर के देश जो सजा करेगा वो सजा भुगतने के लिए तैयार हूं ब्लैक मनी चाह जाए कहां से आ रहा है रे ब्लैक मनी रोज रोज 10 करोड़ आपके इलेक्ट्रल बॉन्ड्स भी इतने ट्रांसपेरेंट है and transparency is electoral bond scheme. <laughs> <Despite that 4, laughs> then a group of retired judges of the Supreme Court and High Courts have written to Chief Justice of India, D.Y. Chandrashur, to express their shared concern regarding the escalating attempts by certain factions to undermine the judiciary through calculated pressure, misinformation and public disagreement. The letter said, quote, their methods are manifold and insidious with clear attempts to sway judicial processes by casting aspersions on integrity of our courts and judges, unquote. Well, the judiciary cannot remain, you know, free of such commentary going forward. So it's, I guess, inevitable in times we live in. Then the CBI, the Central Bureau of Investigation, has registered an FIR against Hyderabad-based Mega Engineering Infrastructure Limited, which was the second biggest buyer of electoral bonds worth 966 crore in an alleged bribery case. And the bribery is of a few lakhs. It's mm. not very much. So mm. I'd like to see what happens to this case. <laughs> because to our case is also being heard today as we speak. Right. Where I have apparently done some major income tax gotala. Uh, but yeah, it's being heard today. <laughs> then uh, in a flare-up after a period of relative peace in Manipur, two persons were killed on Saturday morning in an area at the border at the Methi majority Imphal East District and Kuki Zomi majority. Kang. Pok P district, I hope I've got the pronunciations correct. And also 11 months after violence hit that, Mr. Shah has now gone to Manipur mm -hmm. to, to, to give an assurance that the state will not be divided. 
<laughs> and on the election but all this time he didn't have the time to yes. go not in metro have the time to go he was busy stopping the war in other places then india has lost 2.33 million hectares of tree cover since 2000 i mean this is a very alarming headline and it it depresses me when i read it uh, which is equivalent to 6% decrease in tree cover during this period according to the latest data from the global forest watch monitoring project and i'm assuming this is very accurate data just purely from 2000 to now when cuz you know i've driven across the country cuz i used to do all the travel shows so many of the highways that used to go through forest don't go through forest mm. baki chodo so 15 years ago we were in 2024 till even 2004 5 driving from vasant kunj to vasant vihar you had to pass through yeah, this forest right now it's just malls and buildings malls and buildings then an analysis of official data by pti found that raids by the enforcement directorate increased 86 times while arrests and attachment of assets by the central agencies rose 25 times between 2014 and 2024 this is under the modi government as compared to preceding decades when the congress led united progressive alliance government was in power <coughs> of course depending on how you interpret it it said modi ji is going after the corrupt early no one was going after the corrupt but if you go slightly deeper into the data and see who was arrested and when they joined the party and when then you know kind of files got lost or prosecution stopped the corrupts, the corrupts were let off as soon as they joined the party <laughs> then the united arab emirates uae recorded the heaviest rain after a severe thunderstorm hit the country on monday this is monday night killing at least one person causing damage to homes and businesses bringing air travel to a standstill in dubai i'm sure all of you have seen the videos that have come out of there and today's times of india suggest that it may be because of cloud seeding so if you've seen the netflix series snow piercer now is a good time to go watch it and in is hafte ki yaad la badli where every week we tell you who joined which party from where because it's election season odisha former bjd mp prabhas kumar singh on monday joined the bjp then jammu and kashmir jahan zeb sirwal congress's jammu and kashmir spokesperson also joined the bjp in gujarat former congressman and spokesman rohan gupta joined the bjp and finally in rajasthan bsp mla manoj kumar and jaswant singh gurjar joined shiv sena shinde faction which is also a hmm. bjp ally so this hafte ki adla badli is only adla there's no badli happening i wonder why and another very important um, headline uh, there have been a series of takedowns of youtube channels and twitter accounts in the last one week in fact Twitter, X, formerly called Twitter, has said that they have taken this down on government orders, but they disagree with the order. A uh, national dastak's YouTube channel was taken down. Bolta Hindustan was also taken down, and uh, letters have been written asking them to explain why, how. But uh, it is worrying in my view. And several notices have been issued to the YouTubers, yeah, who had shown the opposition or 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 anybody speaking and against the. And also, there things they have uh, demonetized or what do they call it? Mm. Some channels. In fact, we are doing that Megh- story. And our former colleague Meghnath's channel has also been demonetized. Mm. So those are the headlines of the week. We'll get into the discussion. Uh, let me get into just some general, uh, you know, the, the feedback from our guests. regarding the entire election voting machine you know debate discussion that's been on and off for the longest time and honestly i just say i don't have a position on it because i hear so much and it's so technical like someone is telling me that uh, you know where you press the button and the where the, the slip comes out uh, you know that's between where the data is captured it should not be between that you can't see the slip getting cut there's so many technical So I I just learn something new every day, so it's really blowing my mind. Uh, so before we come to the technical aspects, because we have an expert, and that is the advantage of Hafta, we bring you experts. You don't have to listen to me pelowing yarn on everything. We actually have people who know about stuff. Uh, let me first uh, just ask, uh, you know, uh, so has sir before Madhav gives us the technical aspects. This entire discussion on the robustness of election voting machines, sir. Do you think it? adds to the confidence in the democratic process or as many politicians say it erodes the confidence in the democratic process because depending on which politicians you look at and when he said what everyone has cast aspersion and shown confidence in the voting machines you know when the electronic voting machines came on the scene in the first place uh, there was a quite an amount of excitement 
and people thought that this was not only a technological innovation but also some improvement on the paper ballot uh, because you know paper ballots have a tendency of getting lost paper mm. ballots have a tendency of getting stolen and so on and so forth so in view of that there was a tremendous confidence among the voters about the electronic voting machines there was excitement also about the electronic voting machines over the last decade or so i think uh, it is good that some debate has started about the technological aspects of the electronic voting machines about the obduracy of stiffness of the election commission to count the vv packs and as a result of that a number of anecdotal stories coming out with some proofs sometimes and sometimes without proofs that uh, there is a discrepancy between what i vote for and what my vote is counted for uh, this has eroded over the time the confidence of the voters in the evm leave us at the democratic process as such but the evms definitely have lost that credibility which initially they had uh in the hindu recently we have published loknithi has published uh, one of its findings where we find that compared to some few years ago uh, the confidence of the people the trust of the voters in electronic voting machines has considerably declined this is not good for democracy because unless your processes are trusted democracy cannot be something that people will be really confident confident about Right, and why do you think there is a reluctance of the election commission to count the VV pads? I mean, what what is, in your view, the stated and the unstated objective? Do, I mean, I think one is simply, I mean, the stated objective and unstated objectives may be left aside. Uh, it would be more my take on what the election commission has been doing, and I think the election commission rightly feels, or at least felt at the beginning, that this was a great thing that they have done, and uh, let us not drag back on that. let us go ahead with it uh, they must also have been advised by their technical advisers that there is nothing wrong with this therefore they challenged earlier election commissions challenged the opponents to show what is wrong with electronic voting machines increasingly however the obstinacy of the election commission seems to be more a function of not just their pride in what they are doing but also their laziness in addressing the issues Uh, that technology has produced and uh, made them face right so um you know madhav uh, a couple of reports i just want to point out before we go in there is a report by puna magarwal in the quint and puna magarwal is the same journalist who had actually done that fantastic expose on every like uh, uh, that uh, electoral bond has unique number that can be seen under uv light or infrared i can't tell one from the other Uh, so it's a article in the Quint EVM vote count mismatch in three seventy plus seats and EC refuses to explain, and uh, you know th- that is an article that's worth reading. It gives you an idea of the mismatches that have happened. Uh, now, in light of that and the kind of you know questions that keep getting raised now, it's in the Supreme Court. Madhav, is it correct that if one just counts the VV Pat, it's settled? Because I've now heard one more theory. that the vv pat earlier the way it was designed you saw the slip coming out printed out gets cut and gets dropped now earlier it was like a mirror now it's a prism a lens and therefore it just shines a light but you don't see it getting cut i mean every day i hear something new so it's like this information overload in my head tell us because your article does show you know exactly how the architecture of the machine is tell us what in your technical expertise view is the problem and can it be addressed okay uh, before getting there um, let me take a couple of minutes to point out a few things in the current evm based electronic election system as i call it uh, it is interesting to note that although electronics has come in now the at first attempt to mechanize voting happened in if i'm not mistaken something like 1878 in england so this drive to mechanize voting is not new it's not the way we see it as ultra modern that's one second is we have to look at indian evms in three time spans the first time span is from 1977 to 2013 
where we had, uh, of course, in between we had in 2002, we had a modification. So let's say 1977 to 2002, 2002 to 2013, and 2013 till date. So 1977 was the first time this whole system was designed. And obviously, as any system, this was designed with the context of that time in mind. That time, we didn't have any internet. We didn't have even telephony. So the whole security, you know, don't look at the EVM as a as a single uh, device. Whether, whether monolithic or multi-component, it doesn't matter. Don't look at it only as a device. This has enabled an electronic system. And the whole election system has been affected. So look at the entire system. From that perspective, the system was designed keeping in view the physical aspects in mind. So the security was more physical. We will keep army personnel, we will keep CRPF jawans so that it will not be stolen. That was the kind of security uh, hmm. uh, you know, perspective. It changed in 2002. We had some changes to that. that. And in 2013, a major change happened, which was introduction of VVPAT. So elect this EVM before VVPAT is a different beast, and EVM with VVPAT is a very different beast. Before the VVPAT was introduced, there was one control unit and one ballot unit, one or multiple ballot units. Ballot unit was primarily like a keyboard. It didn't, it really... They had to separate these two because there were many candidates in one constituency. Yeah, which could not fit on one machine. So if you had like 20, yes. you needed many buttons. So you could cascade those keyboards. That was the idea. But both were essentially location agnostic. They had no location specific data in them, those. The, the, the candidate list that was pasted on the, that was a physical pasting. Inside, it uh, saved only two, three, four, the Got button it. presses. So the counts came out like count of two is 200, count of one is 300, you know, something of that kind. Nothing to do with any local candidate. So that is a completely different. So even then you could malfunction, make it malfunction, but you would need physical access to each and every ba ballot unit or control unit. Right. So if there are one lakh uh, polling booths in India, you would need to, to manipulate those, you would need physical access there. Right. That was a big constraint and in a way, big security sure. uh, advantage. With VVPAT, what happened was the third component that was introduced to the EVM, which is the VVPAT, had the mo ha still has the most powerful computing uh, processor inside. It has location-specific data. It has, it knows, you know, who is in position one, who is in position two, not by name, but it has that data inside. Now, if you look at the way the signals flow inside, the control unit tells the ballot unit, be ready, somebody will vote. Tell me wh what value re you receive. Ballot unit, when the voter goes and let's say presses four, ballot unit tells the control unit, I, I've received four. Control unit now tells the VVPAT, print the slip for four. Hmm. VVPAT doesn't know what is at four. Imagine a chest of drawers, each drawer having an image. And those drawers are numbered, one, two, three, four, serially. Hmm. So what VVPAT does is it just goes, opens the fourth drawer, looks at the image and prints that, prints that out. It right. doesn't know what it is. But here, then VVPAT is to respond to the control unit. That yes, I have printed. Now we assume that it will only communicate saying I have printed four. Hmm. it may give extra communication in case if it is aware of what is going on. Let's say in a drawer, I don't, let's say in drawer one, I don't keep only the image, but I also keep a star. Okay. And VVPAT is able to read that star because it, when it opens the drawer, it will see that. Hmm. And it has been programmed. When it was programmed, when it was manufactured, it has been programmed that when you see a star, every third vote, you tell the CU control unit, to put it to star. Correct. That star could be in any drawer. It may not be in the first drawer necessarily. Could, yeah, sure. Got it. it. In, right. So now when, and VVPAT can count how many votes have been cast. So every third vote, if let's say the third vote is four, it might respond instead of saying I've printed four, it might respond I've printed four, say one. 
Right. Now, if control unit can understand that save one, it will record that as save one, which is all this is very easily possible. So this is a very different beast. And without the VVPAT, there was no uh, there was no component in the entire architecture that could actually do this. The VVPAT introduces this component. Right. Now, what they should have done, and this I brought it up, and that's how, after I brought it up on 30th of January and on 7th of February, election, I brought it up, I think, on the 1st of Jan, uh, in my article in the, the in India Forum. After that, 30th of Jan and 1st, 7th of February, Election Commission came out with a technical uh, explanation saying that control unit is the master and these two are slaves. Because otherwise, what they should have done is you have a ba ballot unit in the center. Let's say on the left, you have control unit. On the right, you have VVPAT. Hmm. When I press any button on the ballot unit, the same signal is transmitted to at both. the same time to both. Correct. The VVPAT doesn't have, because it's only printing, right? Right. It receives four. It but, will, but you're saying now the VVPAT is put between the two. Now the VVPAT. That's yeah, the problem. Not between the two. Basically, the whole thing is VVPAT is communicating back to control unit, and that is a problem. That is a problem. So it should not. It should be a one-way communication. That right. is one problem. But that's not all because this is at the at the booth level. Hmm. The other problem, major problem, is there is no pairing. So if I use a pair, let's say hundred and hundred, serial number hundred of control unit and serial number hundred of VVPAT at the booth, there is no guarantee that control unit number 100 will be used at the time of counting because the only verification is visual. Right. And in the days where currency notes can be faked, how difficult is it to fake a label? Hmm. So, and because, see, if you have 20 lakh units, 20, usually as a matter of good practice, 20% units are kept as uh, you know, replacement, possible replacement. Right. So they are they are spare. Now, if somebody lays hand hands on the spare unit, stuffs it with whatever votes they they want, change the label, and replace the control. Yeah, unit. because uh, I mean, there, which is is... No, there is no electronic check; it's only visual check. Whereas electronic pairing we use every day. You have a Bluetooth speaker at home. You pair your phone. With that. I come in. I can't pair my phone to the Bluetooth speaker sure. till you you have not disconnected. Unpaired. Right. Pairing was very easy. Hmm. We haven't we haven't upgraded our thinking. We haven't moved on. So you're saying there's a 77 design, 77 plan with 77. Hmm. Yeah, and then technology. minor changes have been made. But see, again, as uh, Suhas sir mentioned, you know, they have been throwing challenges at people. That's not the right way to do. When when a car manufacturer makes a car. It doesn't throw a challenge at the customer saying, okay, crash it and if you die, I will compensate. No. They go to a third party, get an NCAP certification mm. and prove it to the customer that yes, somebody else other than me is saying that this is safe. In case of election commission, the same people who have filed for the patent have certified it and even today they are giving uh, a certificate again saying that this everything is hunky dory that doesn't work. So, um, I mean, let me give you the differences that I, because I have reported, the only time I was a reporter, I haven't been a reporter for the last, whatever, 24 years, but I was a reporter, it was during two elections, which was paper ballot. The two or three things that are huge advantages from a reporter's point of view, A, I remember the most horrible election I've worked on in 99, I was in Ahmedabad, it was hot as hell, and we, I had to, rub the board there was this big board in this maidan and after each round of voting you had to rub the board next round is chalk se likhte the over three or four days that used to happen and it's a miracle i didn't die of heat stroke by the end of it uh, now it's like fatak i think that that is one good thing uh be the paper stuffing of ballots and the destruction of those ballot papers was another thing that could happen then which can't happen now so these are the from the point of view of a journalist uh but when it comes to the challenge given, uh, you know, uh, even if a challenge is given, Madhav, I think what the Ahmadi party had done very cleverly, they did it in assembly so that he can't be prosecuted, but he got access to a, he said, okay, we will fix it. They said, but you can't touch it. The election commission said, if I can't touch it, then what kind of a challenge is it? Like, remotely, I'm not going to manipulate it. I said, he said, I can manipulate it if you let me touch it. 
He says, manipulate it, but you can't touch the machine. So that was kind of a bizarre challenge. I remember that became a big thing uh, in the early days. So, th- but yeah, it's only been growing this entire distrust. And with, I think, Poonam's story that the election commission should at least come and explain why has there been a mismatch in the VV pads of these 370 machines, which I find it very uh, unfortunate that the e- EC is not uh, explaining. Yeah, uh, if I can interrupt, I can, yeah. I'll tell you two more important things that we need to, and probably Suhas sir would be in a better position to talk Sorry, Madhav, before you come in, let me just introduce the third guest who's here and then you can take over. Uh, we have joining us Shruti Kapila. Hi, Shruti. Last hi, we hi, met, lovely to be back. Yeah. Yes, uh, uh, we, we've met at a conference also in London, I think a year or two years ago. Yeah. Shruti is a professor of history and politics at the University of Cambridge. Her principal fields of scholarship and publications are modern and contemporary India and global political thought. She writes on the history of modern science and race, gender and political violence. Her piece on BJP's manifesto is available in the print and the link is in the show notes below. You can check it out. She will talk a little bit about the BJP manifesto as soon as we finish on the EVM chat. Yes, go ahead, Madhav, you were saying. Right. So there are two more things that I think we need to uh, really consider. The first one is, for the first time, every voter has two votes or the vote in two forms. One is the electronic vote, which is in the control unit, and the other one is the printed vote, which is in the form of VVPAT slip. Hmm. And we have absolutely no clarity which is the original. We can't have two originals. We'll have one original and one copy, right? Right. So there has to be a total clarity on which is the original vote. Going by the current election commission guidelines, the primacy is given to the VVPAT slip. Then the Supreme Court should, in my view, weigh in and say that, okay, if the slip is the primary uh, vote, is then, it, it is count the original, that. Hmm. then it that is the thing to be counted. Hmm. You don't have to you don't have to consider the copy at all. Right. That's the first, first uh, uh, issue. The second issue is, I think uh, the Supreme Court, I do not know why they are, even today there is a hearing going on, and I don't know why they are, are not asking the election commission to get three EVMs right in in the court in and let why don't the judges operate those and see for themselves whether they see the same symbol whether they can see the slip falling down it's mm. so easy both are in delhi it's mm. a phone call away it may be 15 20 30 minutes away just get it in the court verify Right. Why way, Why depend on somebody else? It's it's a. I think, in my view, it's court's duty, considering what is at stake. Considering, you look at German Supreme Court. One voter was unhappy, and the voting election system could not prove to him that his concerns were addressed. Just one single German, and the whole system has been put on hold. You can't use it. Here we have at least a few lakh who are expressing concerns who, who don't have confidence. It doesn't matter whether we have 140 crores and Germany uh, uh, has only uh, for maybe 20 crore Germans. That's mm. not the point. The point sure. is if there are only there is even one single soul whose doubts cannot be addressed reasonably, then it has to be put on hold and it's court's duty to do it. So I don't know why they can't do it. I think also the These F... Are, the effort also to address the doubts. But, uh, you know, before I bring Shruti uh, and Sohas back into the conversation, let me just ask the panel here. Uh, in your view, uh, Raman sir, is it healthier for democracy to have this conversation? Are you satisfied by the, how the EC is handling the, you know, skepticism? Or do you think it undermines the democratic process? No, when I see the politics of it, uh, I, I, I see that the party which is in power is not uh, you know transparent about the system when when the bjp wasn't in power they raised the same issue right. the evm issue and the congress did not do anything about it ec came up uh, occasionally you know with some kind of demo but it never hmm. cleared the mind but at the same time we did not have we don't have any data which suggest that some uh, you know something is wrong with these machines I mean, some solid data, even Mm -hmm. Lokniti uh, has come up with this uh, survey and it was raised in Supreme Court yesterday. Mm. The Supreme Court also did not, they said they want more credible, uh, Mm. you know, organization. And Lokniti is private, so they are not even considering that. Mm. So, uh, and and now when uh, the BJP is in power, 
and Congress is raising the same and the other parties are raising the issue. The BJP is also not very transparent about it. But you know, after hearing the experts, uh, and also I want to say Prashant, I know Mr. Prashant Bhushan and he's one of the parties to mm. this, you know, petition. So I, as a reporter, you know, there was a time when I also had doubts about this AVM mm. machine. So I was talking to him. So he had also told us uh, that Raman Max, you know, it will be, you you can make maybe 10% or 5%, but otherwise there's nothing wrong with the machine. Even Mr. Bhushan had said that. Mm. But having said it, it doesn't mean that he can't change his opinion because sure. it's technology, things may change. Sure. And after hearing these experts, uh, I definitely feel that a doubt has really emerged uh, you know, among the people. It and it, is, it, is a, it should be addressed. And I think also it considering the election addressed. commission's credibility has eroded as has for most institutions. Mm. I think it's incumbent for everybody uh, uh. to actually come out and be up for scrutiny. What do you think, Anand? Do you think it... It is dangerous. Also, you know, I think it's, uh, I mean, I I haven't given it thought, but the, like we said in the headlines, the social media platforms are either delisting or uh, deprioritizing any video or information that is related to EVM machines yeah. and questioning them. Uh, I mean, they're saying that it may undermine democracy. I was like, okay, that I, I'm not sure I agree with that, but yeah, on all these or anything else related to this, Anand, what, what are your insights or views? No, I think election commission's approach to conduct of elections has been of incremental adequacy, means a, a step by step improvement. They are not for very radical revision of the procedures. Mm. And that gets reflected in how, how the change is slow. So the critical marsh of uh, feedback, uh, uh, which uh, are uh, which is a skeptical of the functioning of EVMs, I think uh, that point has not been reached. It will take time, and it will like uh, mm, uh, incrementally. It has tried to uh, address some questions through mm. BBPAT or or uh, a sample ten percent of uh, uh, audit. Uh, or, or other me methods but uh, I think it is also a function of time the way the election commission functions uh, second uh, is uh, uh, about uh, um, the German constitutional court that Mr. Despande uh, was mentioning now it's a uh, uh, guiding principle was that something that uh, a citizen uh, can only know through expertise and scientific knowledge and not uh, a layman can know then that ha process has to be discarded that was its uh, 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 running theme of the judgment uh, so uh, and uh, that came up in the supreme court hearing yesterday and the judge said uh, that well that both are not comparable and the same point that mr despande uh, mentioned that uh, india has 98 crore voters and it's a country of 5 crore voters the, mm. what you are comparing the logistical and administrative challenges are different but i think there is one more uh, i think flaw with the german uh, constitutional courts uh, view uh, that uh, Mm, say some technological innovations like uh, digital payments mm. or uh, uh, could not be introduced if the same argument was taken. People would not have trusted uh, the digital technology with their money because some processes there are also very complex. But uh, uh, but of course, there is an, another argument that about transparency. Now, third is, uh, oh, I think Supreme Court today has uh, observed in the ongoing observation that the number of VVPATS verification, uh, Mr. Wusson's uh, 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 um, petition was for 100% uh, slips, uh, mm. but it said it could be increased. Uh, means it's not the final judgment, but the observation is that it could be increased, the number of VVPATS. Uh, oh, it's basically Counting. a print printout uh, that would be dropped sure. by the voter himself in uh, so mm. that 
also supreme court is quite clear that uh, we cannot go back to the ballot paper ballot sure. b- paper ballot uh, because that was the age of electoral banditry mm. a simple ink mark on the paper could mm. be uh, enough for Destroying invalidating that. the yeah. vote so and then, then these are um, three four points i could so um, i'll just come quickly on this to kapila and sohasa once again but you know talking about the context that any system operates in i think the 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 tendency of anyone with power um and that is a cultural aspect of india feeling they don't have to explain is a very indian thing i think it comes from the caste system uh media doesn't feel it's answerable uh, like today you cannot get a journalist to take questions um and even in that i mean and I, i will say this is consistent even mr pranoy you know today we can say media has gone insane but even back then uh, many times i had requested dr roy that you know p- p- the media rumble we had you know let's uh no we are not the story and i know it doesn't come from the humility that we are not the story it comes from the position of we don't have to explain we are good uh i think that is very fundamental to the privileged indian and there's no more privileged indian than a bureaucrat Uh, so they don't feel that they're answerable. That is, I think, a big problem. And in that context, I think in India it's more important to make sure that the system is uh, demonstrated to be, you know, fair and clear. Because I mean, I went to Amsterdam uh, a year ago, and at the airport you have self checkout. I could pick up salad, salad. There's this mirror kind of thing. You flash it there. Your bill comes. I take out my credit card, pay whatever it comes to, and I walk out. No human has even checked. Have I? I mean, I could have shown a Gobi ka barcode and taken out, you know, a Loki or whatever, or a Porsche or whatever it is. But the point is, there the system assumes that boss, by and large, people try to put that here. Mm. I mean, just try. So you have to see the context in which you're operating, and I think the context in which you're operating to say that trust us. I'm sorry, that is not good enough for me. Whether it's the media, whether it is, which is why we have these regular Zoom calls with our subscribers. who can ask us that why did you cover this why did you not cover this where are you getting your funding from where is it's it's on our website before we put it out there try to ask a media where you get your money from they will not tell you even today when we say you tell us how much money you got from the up state government or the punjab state government or the central government they don't tell you rti dalni padti hai hame media ko batana chahiye itna paisa mila so no one wants to be held accountable and i think the election commission is an extension of that very feudal mindset ki boss we don't have to show you just assume we are great people so anyway, one thing about uh, that that uh, the facts the frequently uh, asked questions now uh, the i think commissions election commissions uh, uh, approach is that there can be doubts but uh, only reasonable doubts would be answered now the test of reasonable reasonable reasonableness is with them that mm. what is a reasonable doubt now uh, supreme court yesterday observed that uh, uh some t's can be ticked some i's can be dotted but the text cannot be abandoned because it's it's a working system and uh, yes there can be some changes here and there but overall the system is accurate so uh, that is how the court is also moving on this petition although i'm not sure i agree with the court being so certain at this yeah. stage but yeah uh, uh, you know go ahead uh, you know then we'll come back to the bjp manifesto so let's get shruti into this what do you think shruti is it compromising the are we doing a trump and putting question marks on the <laughs> democratic process or are we being transparent seeking do gooders I don't know I think it's a bit of both I I think that it would be fair to say that uh, the doubts some of the doubts being uh, raised uh, I mean they're not very focused I think the the EVM debate is focused it is focused on one particular institution and one particular machine but I think there is uh, such a lot of conversation about disinformation about say x about you know you know it, it's a, it's a lot Uh, in in the sense that when th- something is obviously going on i'm not saying that but i think the uh, um and it's it's and it, it's no one's argument that the government or the ruling regime hasn't in a way dominated uh you know political info- any information order as it were right it is it is running the information order 
And, uh, but I think there is, I mean, I find it interesting because uh, it's, because I'm here, I mean, I'll travel in a bit to India, but uh, it is becoming harder now to get on, you know, as it were, algorithmically, a wider range of views and things. So you have to go now specifically to particular websites or profiles to see what a particular leader is up to at any given point or seek notifications. So there is like at a very basic level, even in terms of digital, the way information is flowing, uh, you know, or coming to you as an end user, uh, there it's there's a, there is, you certainly feel something is up. Uh, and, you, sure. know, you, you do feel that, you know, uh, a very, you know, very, so so I think that's, I mean, it's a big issue. And I do think the Supreme Court judgment on EVM is going to matter. The credibility of the Election Commission is going to matter. You may say that India, I mean, that's a very big debate why India is or not a rules-based society or why the Indian state is seen only as a kind of uh, 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 intervening force in your life and not something that we kind of engage with. And, you know, we see it as a very powerful instrument, which is out to get us. Um, uh, I think that's a separate debate, but it's linked to all that. Uh, I mean, I think um, it's, it's a very strange election. I mean, what is there to say? It's not like the Trump thing at all, because that's very, very polarized. Yeah. Also, uh, also he, I, I think that Trump's <coughs> motive was to, you know, no, but I also want to process. make the point that the the, the DNC, the Democrats, uh, you know, as well as the Republicans, are two well-oiled machineries. You know, uh, that is, I mean, this is not about bringing out the level playing field issue, but there is no comparison to be had between, as it were, a very fragmented op opposition with oh, very, sure. very small players to very old and tired players. Um, you know, it's a completely different system. The American and the it's very evenly poised. I mean, it's a much more divided uh, uh, institutional framework. No, no, uh, also the ability. Seen, in the yeah. Indian one seems to be very dominant in one particular way at the moment. And also the agencies, you know, the role they play here and they play there is, is very different. But Suhas, before we come to you for the BG manifesto, I want to go uh, for the last word. Uh, on this to Madhav, but before I do that, you have anything to add to this entire EVM debate based on what you have heard so far from the panelists? This is a question of institutional trust. And unless people trust that EVM are working well, I don't think any amount of just claims would suffice. And that's why Madhav's or anyone else's questions need to be robustly and technically answered rather than simply claims being thrown across that everything is good. That, I think, is the rub of the situation. And last time we have seen that there was a discrepancy in a number of cases between the uh, physical count and the EVM count of votes in certain booths. And therefore, I think such discrepancies, when they remain unanswered, they add to the suspicion. Then they add to rumors. And finally, they add to the undermining of the entire idea of legitimacy of the democratic system. That's why this is something that needs to be addressed. Madhav, last word to you before we start discussing hardcore politics. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as uh, Suhas sir said rightly, you know, trust is the cornerstone of all this. And that's why I said the Supreme Court should uh, satisfy themselves by doing this, by, by making those trials. Uh, the second thing is, you know, it's very simple. Even if we go to a Hawaii and ask him for 100 grams of peda, when he packs it, if there is a chance and we would like to see what he's packed, you know, hmm. we always like to see. Why is that? We we might know that halwai every day, but we'll still want that. Or we, if we ask him, oh, do you use ghee or do you use Dalla. oil? Hmm. And he refuses to answer. Hmm. Then you will start suspecting. If he answers to you saying that, okay, I use this ghee or I use this oil, you're happy. You may not like the oil, but you're happy. You're not, you don't have issues about transparency and trust. Here, the problem is they they just refuse to answer. I have filed so many RTIs and it's been absolutely useless. Stonewalled. And where are one these? Of the, where one are of these? the RTIs, I got a response. This doesn't come under RTI because you have framed your own question. And to me, I'm still trying to fathom what that sentence means. What is I the right no question? Clue. I have no clue. Uh, and, and where are these units manufactured? The Bharat these units are manufactured at Bharat Electronics and uh, uh, ECIL. Electronics Corporation of India. Okay. The thing is, 
Dick, I mean, I have nothing against uh, because because if, if we were to manufacture this in let's say some private co company, uh, then we would say, oh, why is this contract given to the private uh, vendor? So, public sector is good, not a problem. Thing is, come clean, come clean. There is no absolutely no problem opening up the circuit diagram because ultimately the manufacturing will be with you. You claim that you have digital certificates. Hmm. So digital certificates like a boarding pass to a plane. When you go into the plane, you need a boarding pass, but you also need your own identity. Right. Just a pass doesn't because I could give my pass to you and you could sure. still go in if the identity was not checked. Right. But at a group level, you if you have two hundred boarding passes, you will not have two hundred one people. So at a group level, that security works. At individual level, it doesn't work. Hmm. But at the group level, you have it. So come clean. Right. That's the problem. Okay, thank you so much for joining us, Madhav. Before I say goodbye, I'm going to ask you to recommend uh, something that could enrich the lives of our listeners, an article, a piece. Your article will, of course, be linked to this podcast, but anything else you think they should consume? I uh, I mean, I think it would be only good on my part not to recommend my own article. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> I won't do that. Uh, but if you want, I mean... Uh, Currently, I'm reading uh, Dharmanand Kosambi's Bhagwan Buddha, and it's absolutely fascinating. I just finished reading Atharva Veda, hmm. but uh, anybody interested in real, because that's the only religion that is atheist, just as a matter of interest. So anybody interested in doing that, I would recommend that. And do you and think also, it's somewhat ironic that uh, a book about an atheist religion is called Bhagwan Buddha? <laughs> yeah, it is ironic. Because that's how the people see it, right? Right, so, right. But the book is extremely well researched and extremely well written. Fantastic. So, I would, so might I also recommend after, if you haven't already, you must listen to this poem in Amitabh's voice of Harivan Shai Bachchan on Buddha. We have once played it here. It's a, it's a really nice one. I've, I've always enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Madhav, for joining and shedding light on something that is so dense that many people just abandon even discussing it. Uh, so I hope to see more articles by you to provide more clarity on this issue. And good luck with those RTIs. Stay at it. It's thank you. Hard I one. But thank you so much for coming. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, now we're going to go to the BJP manifesto and all things political. But before that, I want to remind all our listeners and viewers... Pay to keep news free because when the public pays, the public is served. We only take money from all of you because we believe only when public pays for journalism will it be public interest journalism. So you will not see any banner ads which you'll see on many places of either a waving neta from Karnataka, Kerala. Usually it's UP because UP netas, I, I don't know, Yogi has just covered Delhi with his bug shot. <laughs> so, uh, but we only depend on you. So, you know, top up our election funds. And as you've seen, we've got a new election show, a mini-series of Srinivas and Jain. So Vasu will be doing a show with the News Minute and News Laundry for this election. In this election, I will travel across the country to dissect the powerful narratives driving the BJP's campaign. How much are claims and how much is reality? Follow me on a journey that cuts through the noise and brings you the facts. Journalism that is free, fair and in your interest. And in all likelihood, we'll also get another very well-known journalist from the Northeast. Mm -hmm. He'll be doing about four stories from us. Hridesh Joshi is also here. So News Laundry and News Minute Coalition is the place where we want to get good journalists to come and do journalism that is no longer possible to be done on legacy media. So on that note, the BJP manifesto. Uh, let me come to the two experts who have written much about it and are researchers and professors as opposed to us who just like to chew the fat once in a while, once a week. So, uh, let me come to you, Suhas, sir, first and then Shruti. Uh, the BJP manifesto, it's, you know, these days I've been listening to this song, which reminds me of Mr. Modi each time I hear it. Because Mr. Modi said, this is now a trailer, hai. film is <laughs> hai. 10-year trailer. Mm. So, there's this very beautiful song, Jhuthi Muthi Mitwa Van Bole Bhado bole, kabhi saavan bole, ki bhai, abhi aega. So, now apparently, I haven't read the manifesto. I'm guessing some of it has been read by the panelists here because they would, uh, you know, have spent more time on this. A UCC has been promised, Uniform Civil Code. And uh, they have promised one nation, one, nation one election. 
सो सुहास सर द डिजायरेबिलिटी ऑफ दीज एंड एनीथिंग एल्स दैट यू थिंक इज नॉट वर्दी इन द मैनिफेस्टो एज कंपेयर टू द अदर्स वेल द मोस्ट नॉट वर्दी थिंग अबाउट द मैनिफेस्टो इज नॉट इज दैट इट्स नॉट द बीजेपी मैनिफेस्टो इट इज अ मोदी मैनिफेस्टो एंड दैट इज समथिंग दैट नीड्स टू बी केप्ट इन माइंड दैट द पार्टी इज कंप्लीटली साइड ट्रैक एंड इट इज ओनली मोदी हु इज गारंटिंग अस वेरियस थिंग्स and therefore it's his world against the party or our world and everyone else's world but that's sort of the general critique of what the modi guarantee means uh, on the specific questions that you ask i think the ucc thing uh, is uh, something that the bjp and the hindutva brigade generally wanted for over last 70 years or so and therefore in a sense for their core constituency this is something that would be very attractive do elusive they don't know what to do about it if the ucc that has been brought in uttarakhand is any indication it will come obviously with riders or exceptions which is in not a ucc then yeah they have hmm. done that in uttarakhand sure. and therefore then the charge that they are interfering only with the muslim personal law would stick uh, the challenge however that the ucc point throws at the opposition is that they have to take a position on how to handle the question of reforming muslim personal law the opposition hides behind the muslims but doesn't have a clear answer to that hmm. fortunately for the opposition the bjp too does not want any serious debate on the question of ucc it is only using it as a beating stick uh, a whip cord nothing more than that the other i think is a more dangerous and probably far reaching proposal uh, for which the covin committee has already made a recommendation uh, which is one nation one election or simultaneous elections or whatever you call it and that really means irrespective of what prime minister modi has been assuring a complete overhaul of the constitution hmm. because unless you change the constitution you cannot bring simultaneous election sure i have said this again and again that simply speaking simultaneous elections in the sense jeopardize a the parliamentary structure and b the federal structure and once you have done that you have changed the entire constitution again rss and hindutva organizations have always been extremely skeptical about federalism hmm. and simultaneous elections would be a very nice way for them to interfere in the federal structure so sure. i think these two can be controversial but the latter one the simultaneous elections one is far too dangerous than we realize it right uh, thanks so much i i must say that it is such a pleasure having someone who speaks with such clarity mm. and complete sentences uh, because you know when you consume media people talk like me one sentence goes into the other so we must have you more often especially in explainers so has but shruti uh, you know as a commentator you know a political scientist and as a woman you know uh, my colleague manisha isn't here and manisha yes. is a very rational person and you know she is not quote unquote hindutva brigade or quote unquote you know muslim appeasement brigade or anything but as a woman and she is a very uh, fierce for, uh, feminist uh, you know she had lots of problem with the kind of laws that exist uh, which kind of discriminate against women at state level at you know inheritance level at in islam with the you know th- three talaq thing so of course she was not a ucc advocate but she says there has to be a law that gives me as much power as a man i cannot be a you know no matter what religion i belong to so there is a legitimate case to be made for an overhaul of our legal system that you know doesn't disadvantage a woman uh, and that happens at a state level at an inheritance level at many levels uh, even at the talaq level so your take on the whole uc thing and also I, i just like to give our audience one thing that you know we take western democracy that have been around for 200 250 years uh, even in america mind you there are certain states where you can only do a business if you have a partner who's um, native american or if you're native american you get fishing rights and if you are you know a white caucasian american you don't have rights so you have to buy a permit but there are certain forest areas where you have automatic hunting licenses automatic fishing rights adoption laws are different for native american children and uh, you know white caucasian or any settlers i don't know what is the term for that so there are you know different laws for different people in different countries because the reasons are different uh, and when you go into the historical aspect of why they are often justified 
how does one reconcile these many demands in your view and anything else about the manifesto that you want to tell us yeah. and our viewers about i mean i think there's a lot going on here in your in your commentary i mean just on the ucc i mean it's a long standing issue uh, at the formation of the indian constitution and the republic itself uh, and uh, you know and i think it has it is one is obviously the feminist question of equal rights on which actually india was far ahead of many western democracies in giving universal adult uh, you know suffrage mm. and franchise and so you've always had as it were women as equal rights bearing uh, citizen including in you know very controversial things like abortion uh, that have in a way you know distorted american mm. democracy uh, as we know it continues to so at at one level you know the indian constitution is extremely uh, radical forward looking and all about equality the issue with personal law or family law is precisely that what uh, professor parshika was saying that it actually becomes a focused on the minority question because it is after all at at, at the formation of the indian constitution it is the only set of rights that the muslim minorities could get uh, remember there were you know uh, communal as it were seats and you know you had as it were um, you know reserved seats uh, which went we you know, post partition and and so no political or economic rights were given uh, to the muslims but the only kind of as it were so called concession was in the cultural domain of 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 personal of, law of personal law but the initial debates are not actually about uh, about muslim personal law in india but of, of course on the hindu undivided family uh, you know in the 1950s sure. i mean it is one of uh, nehru's biggest humiliations of his career you know, quite apart from ambedkar you know having to resign and leave uh, the indian government uh, so the issue really has been and was, you know has really actually been the reform of hindu personal law because it's really only till the, after the eight, eight in the late 80s early 90s onwards that women start inheriting uh, under that law you know and it takes good 50 60 years so i think this is a contentious issue this is as uh, professor parjika says that you know if and when it will come uh, it will uh, it will extract a lot of compromise from you know from from various uh, from various groups and it will be interesting to see how as it were the so called hindu orthodox or hindu traditionalists are now going to refer to it apart from saying whether the ucc is just going to be a default hindu first uh thing because it's already in uh practice in case law now i mean it's a huge field of uh, debate and research so i mean i'm just glossing other people's work by case law already there is now a considerable amount of uniformity in practice uh right. you know that uh, so so that already has happened and i think the criminalization of triple talaq was also a step in 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 that direction having said all of this i mean i do think that this is a very weird manifesto uh this is you know the bjp you know uh, uh it's uh, i mean uh, it's got like 60 odd images in a 76 page document of prime minister modi so of course it is about modi ji but in terms of its um uh, in terms of as it were its promises apart from the ucc which is a kind of ongoing demand of of the hindu nationalists it's not a new demand that has been put i mean it's interesting that it wants to kind of lower the temperature on on hindutva which is not to say that that will or will not be their intention there is nothing on kashi and mathura hmm. for a uh, instance uh there is also nothing on the nrc which is obviously you know the the home ministers and the home ministries kind of so the the kinds of things that we have been hearing from the ramparts are not the things that have gone into uh as it were this promissory note uh so that's fun first thing to notice that is it uh, is the bjp trying to moderate the very passions it has unleashed and which it cannot now control Uh, i mean that's one uh, one you know it begs that uh, question and the second is i mean for me i think if you look at it for all the talk and bluster of india becoming this gigantic economy you know this massive pride of being you know the fifth largest economy headed towards the third largest you know status uh, i mean it is absolutely you know whether you're an economic liberal or a, or on the progressive side whether you are more on the progressive big state side or the free market uh, person regardless of where you stand on on the economic uh, spectrum this is a singularly uh, like a document lacking in economic vision 
And and it is it is absolutely shocking because if you're going to play global status games, hmm. uh, you might want to seize the opportunity that global, you know, to shape and direct, uh, uh, you know, the world economy. There is nothing here which is, you know, it's Singapore light with a lot of infrastructure tech talk, you know, photographs of like, you know, Singapore like, you know, uh, infrastructure hmm. and tech. And then there's all these guarantees. You know, I mean, you know, from farmers, old people, young people, and it doesn't like it doesn't cohere. It doesn't tell us what the roadmap is, uh, and therefore, it is really an admission of defeat that you know this is uh, this has been the, the last ten years have produced economic strife and have produced you know the fact that tens of millions of Indians have to be given food rations at, as a guarantee for the next five years. Yeah, you know. Uh, I mean, it's it's it's, sure. it's it's it should be shaming for for any any for anyone for especially for a country which wants to sit on the top table of the world economy. So I think there are like I think for all the glitz and the Modi mania and and all of that as a promissory note, because one of the interesting things about the BJP is that it does listen to its own manifesto. Right, triple talaq was in the manifesto. Yeah, the Ram Temple. I mean, I, I I myself, uh, you know, they it's it's a. Uh, you know, humbling of my cockiness a few years ago, although I still believe it was unconstitutional, mm -hmm. uh, because I had the privilege of seeing a debate between Ram Jait Malani, mm -hmm. who was a force to reckon with even till 92, and Subramanyam Swami, on is it constitutionally possible to revoke Article 370? Mm -hmm. And I was moderating that discussion, and I was blown mm -hmm. away by the clarity and the laws that Ram Jait yeah, provided. So, I mean, I mean so it was absolute... never possible, but they made it possible. So they've delivered on but everything. That that if you look at it, their manifestos, these things are there. These, not, they, these things have not come from nowhere. And they deliver. And the point being that this, as a promissory note, is a is a blur. I mean, to have even, I mean, you know, it might be cute or laughable to to say that they're, you know, that they will put a program for wedding in India, for wedding destinations. Now, is this really worthy of like a major economic power the to be thinking in this sure. manner at the same time, you know? I've read the manifesto with a tooth comb because right. I take their manifesto seriously. And it is lacking in vision, direction, and it it is an admission of defeat. So do they... Certainly of economic defeat. So do they only give a venue as a political engine or can aging old uncles like me also kind of find prospective brides? Because, I mean, I'm happy to take a venue. I don't know about that. You'll have to ask them. So they, just, I, I, they, they, could do a, they, they could do a coordination with Shadi.com or something. This this manifesto is brought to you like, by Shadi.com. Is it a Zoya Akhtar effect? I mean, I like, know. it's literally called Wed in India. Oh, really? And okay. So find it's a, it in, you know, in that document... So anyway, but that's like by the by, but which just tells you it it it's it's an indication of how um dispersed the manifesto is. And 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 the only thing that is clear is that it is uh it is trying to like soften or manage expectations on on the kind of you know the core Hindutva concerns, you know, Kashi, Mathura, NRC, uh, you know, delim delimitation is missing. You know, right. so you have one nation, one pole, but not uh, delimitation. Which, of course, the prime minister has also been speaking no, no. About. But I think the delimitation would actually throw, uh, uh, you know, there'd be red flags going up in the south, and right now it's important they get at least a few seats there because they have hardly any presence. But Anand, uh, have you gone through the manifesto? Uh, what are your, you know, basic takeaways from that? But I will say on one thing, which often I see, you know, ministers saying fifth largest one going to third largest, and I think on that I completely agree with the more sensible economist, that has no meaning. It's, it's like saying, I'm the smartest, you know, guy in news laundry because, you know, I have the most hair on my head. Like, it has nothing. Yeah, what is your per capita income? I mean, you're 329 million he hectares, this country is. You better be the fifth largest, yeah, you know, and you're the most populous. But what does that have to do with, I mean, it, it is not. So this whole largest economy is a boast, which I, I, I find strange. But yeah, Anand, what, what is your takeaway from the manifesto? And, Achievable, non-achievable. I'm sorry, do you think that they have kept out this delimitation be because they want seats from the south and it will throw red flags there? But they'll come up with it later? No, uh, I think they have uh, um, kept aside a lot of contentious uh, elements. Mm. And uh, mm -hmm. there is also, uh, I think it's a manifesto of a party which is very assured of a renewed mandate. Mm. And it has not uh, put a lot of energy in it. It's unlike Congress, which was uh, very uh, eager to tick too many boxes. 
like this also that also we have to appeal to this segment also also so uh, a, it's a, also a manifestos in this age of round the clock uh, uh, political communication uh, have uh, they were not anyway very important for electoral results they were more of uh, uh, stuff for academic discussions and uh, some in policy circles uh, i don't think they have had a very uh definitive electoral impact but uh, as a social register as a political register for uh, uh, reference they are still important so uh one thing let let me begin like uh, um, uh, how it is different from other manifestos of the party like in 2014 uh, um, shruti kapila is here she, she wrote in the outlook that uh, bjp has come as a conservative party but paradoxically paradoxically it is a byword for change so uh, so uh, it's a, a transformative on many uh, things mm. uh, uh, like uh, it has uh, say on the um, cultural policy it has ram mandir then uh, uh, then it has uh, this uh, um, in the pop, uh, uh, on political issues it has abrogation of 372 mm. of the things achieved now uh, when it uh, comes to mm, a very entrenched political entity in the indian system now it, the transformation is a work in progress for it so uh, it's now uh, uh, ki- kind of uh, a new version of a bjp system uh, till 1970s uh, rajni kothari said congress system it may not be as absorptive or umbrella party kind but uh, it it is now seeing itself as a system and very cautious about uh, what it now uh, promises it it is this cautious about over committing hmm. so uh, yes. and agree so a uh, uh, second thing is that uh, oh, oh, one uh, um, thing if you compare the congress and bjp manifesto also so there is lack of in both manifestos to be fair uh, there is lack of say welfareist Im- imagination of a, a welfare of a welfare architecture and more of dole out culture so dole out culture what uh, political commentator hilal ahmed say it is we are in an age of charitable state function like uh, welfare as charity mm. now th- this is scheme that is scheme 1000 rupees this this but overall architecture of welfareism has suffered and there is la- lack of imagination in both so very specific dole outs this 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 mm. this mm. but not a system which will sustain a welfareist uh, um, say policy over a period of time uh, which would be an empowering agent sure. empowering agent for uh, a sizable section of the population so these are the few things uh, also uh, on ucc let's say uh, uh, means uh, it's of, of course it's a direct principle of a state policy in article 44 uh, so uh, but it uh, uh, i think they will uh, roll out this is the for next five years my sense i may be wrong they will uh, uh, this is the big thing that they plan to do uh, in the next few months after the election uh, because uh, going by the their track record in the months which are of uh, uh, all this is as assuming that they come back to power mm. so uh, Uh, because th- th- those are the months of least in uh, anti incumbency mm. so they did the um, sub so ayodhya judgment was through judiciary but uh, say um, abrogation of 370 uh, it was in august and uh, these are the things that they do early in their term as uh, the big changes the tweaks this so i mean i i will say that abrogation uh, of the ram temple while I think it's just a technicality to give credit to the Supreme Court. Uh I think they can without I mean I I I think it was a very unfair thing to have happened. I think it to our social fabric it was it was worrying. But if you just remove that aspect from it, you can criticize the BJP that oh it wasn't the Supreme Court did it. But let's be clear, had Modi not been PM, 
it would not have happened mm-hmm. so i think they can take credit for that without without the caveat of that oh, it is the supreme court order but so what do you make of uh, the 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 whole ucc promise and other promises and i want to know no. that if if article 370 can be abolished and we can buy land in kashmir why can i not buy land in my hometown of dehradun because uh, when i lived there for all my life till i was an adult and my mother had a house then she had to sell it because any empty house in dehradun would get taken over by gadwalis because if you were not living there if it was an empty house then you could not get them out and now you can't buy it then abolish article 371 also but they would never dare to do that because they do <laughs> election all of northeast and all the pahadi states no. which they have 100% right now you know they get 7 out of 7 5 out of 5 hmm. no let us be very clear that the ucc is not an instrument to bring liberty for women they are not using ucc mm. you know to bring mm. you know to make women more liberal how ever how much ever you codify the human behavior mm. uh this is more to do with the patriarchal society, you know attitude of the society i think our our laws are pretty liberal so ucc here is to further consolidate hindu votes so that's how i feel and i mean of course it is part of directive principles sure the way they are using it the way they have weaponized it like the triple talaq ah, it's it's, it's it a very a different way they are, they are just trashing you know one particular community uh so this is about the ucc i think as swasar had said i think the major uh, fundamental issue of this uh, i mean of course uh, anand has also sp- spoken about dole out he has very rightly said so but the main thing is one nation one election, one election. so we are already a uh, you know federal country with the you know unitary mm. features mm. so that's what as student of political science we have read over the years but now i think this is the major threat and this is what uh, prime minister has been reemphasizing uh, you know uh, in his interviews uh, to uh, various uh, you know media groups and uh, also uh, if you just see that how fast they have come out with the committee and the committee within a month or has two has given a report has given a <laughs> report yeah. also uh, on this issue i think this is what they are going to fast track uh, you know in the next election and uh, and this is the major danger uh, to our uh, democracy yeah I, i and i think it's also unfortunate how a former president was a willing party to this farce mm. uh, it's it's really unfortunate yes. but you know last words to our two panelists so has sir you've heard what everyone had to say around up uh, as far as manifestos are concerned how important are they in your view in election i mean has csds ever done a story study that how, what percentage of voters vote based on manifesto having been read and how many go by just who i love and who i hate and it's an emotional like how important is manifesto in the larger scheme of winning an election in your view or is it just that people like us sit around discuss it like and uska hota nahi you know there is no data on uh... uh whether people vote on the basis of manifesto or not uh that's one the second thing is however that parties themselves never really make it a point to popularize their manifest manifesto publicize their manifesto uh, as part of their election campaign uh, elections actually have their own dynamism and uh, manifestos are mainly for records in a sense and for uh, boardroom discussions or drawing room discussions uh in india uh, manifestos also do not delineate any definite policy outline that the party would really like to follow it's merely a list of slogans and pious wishes beyond that the manifestos rarely go as a result of that manifestos can be used in a campaign only as partly as a slogan as a sloganeering posture and nothing beyond that uh right now for example we have been discussing this question as to whether kashi mathura are not part of the manifesto and does that mean anything and i would dare say that it simply doesn't mean anything because in courts and on the ground these are going to be the issues mm. the prime minister has already flagged that the question of muslim appeasement and the question of hindu assertion are going to be the central issues of the election so whatever the manifesto says it is only to gloss over this gory reality and to say that no no we are doing something for welfare beyond that it doesn't mean much and this is not only about the bjp manifesto i am saying this generally about manifestos of other parties as well 
Take the Congress, for example, though we are not discussing the Congress right now, uh, what have they done to their manifesto? Hmm. I haven't come across any Congress karyakarta, the cadre or the campaigner, actually using the manifesto and saying, hey, here are our job guarantees. They are just clueless about job guarantees. So if the party workers themselves don't know about job guarantees, if the governments themselves of the run by the Congress don't follow that manifesto, the Nyai manifesto of the last election, uh, why should we only be blaming BJP? In the sense, it is a cynicism that uh, uh, characterizes most political parties. Fair enough. Shruti, last word to you. Um, well, I mean, I think uh, a lot of it is sort of true, but I think manifestos is a great benchmark. If you're a historian or if you're an analyst, they offer a benchmark between what may be a wish of a party and what ends up being the reality. And a lot of politics is between this kind of domain of you know vision and wish and as it were, the work of actually real politics or what actually ends up happening. So I actually find them rather useful. And I do find them also in general quite useful and just kind of even the fact that, you know, that the fact that, yes, I mean, Professor Bajikal is absolutely right. The road to the courts has been taken on Kashi and Mathura. Right. So that genie has, you know, that's left. The, the, the train has left the station and it's going to roll and roll. But it's for me as an analyst, very interesting that they have not put their they've not put their, as it were, political will behind it openly mm. at this point. Right. And that in itself is a kind of indicator of that. Is it that for me, therefore, I think the opposition has had an effect on this electoral election already because it's precisely these kind of nyai guarantees uh, that, you know, the five guarantees that the Congress put out uh, that has actually ended up, you know, in a very pirated form in the BJP uh, uh, in, in the BJP election manifesto. So in that sense, you know, it is a victory in some ways of the opposition that a moderated BJP, it may be not very authentic, mm. it officially has to stand by its wish list in this form. So I think it's it's a it's a kind of it's an interesting uh, it's for that very reason a very telling document. Uh, whether people vote on it, uh, I don't, I mean, you know, CSDS or, you know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure, uh, you know, uh, but I do think uh, whether uh, the idea of the guarantee has already now become uh, commonplace to the Indian political lexicon. And that, of course, has an effect uh, on, on the election. And the fact that, as you know, the previous person was saying, that there is no welfare architecture. It has been dismantled in the last <coughs> few years. And these have now become highly personalized guarantees. Uh, and, and, you know, so there's a kind of deinstitutionalization uh, 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 that has taken place in front of our eyes uh, on one of the biggest spends of, of the government. Anyway, so so interesting. I find them interesting. I wouldn't, as, as a historian, I mean, there's a, one of the few things I can go by to kind of, you know, as evidence of what actually was said at uh, officially and uh, and very telling. And they have been, right. and I think the BJP manifesto at this moment is telling that the, the, the BJP wants to cool the temperature. Uh, it You know, a little bit, it wants to bring the heat down on some of the very things that, you know, it has uh, gained uh, by over the last uh, over the last 10 years. So I have a theory on that, but I'll let that be for another day. Tell us day. a theory, tell us. I mean, a no. lot of people have written to me about that. And, you know, a lot of senior journalists and a lot of people have like texted me about it. What's your theory? My, my theory, it's a hedge uh, because uh, yes. it's a hedge uh, of Mr. Modi and Shah uh, because they, they don't have very good friends inside the party. Uh, so it is a hedge to try to attract some people outside the BJP in case they face a rebellion inside. So that's my theory. But yes, it's all going to come down to the margins, which tells you that it's actually a much more contested field. Sure, no, that, uh, that it is. That it absolutely I, is. In fact, very, very contested field, and and the manifesto is an admission of that. It is an admission of economic defeat, and it is an admission that, well, I mean, Indians uh, might like Modi very much, but uh, it's not very clear they are, you know, how hot they are on getting them back into power for the third for the third term you know for right. a historic third term th this is a very subdued election absolutely uh, yeah it doesn't have the noise that election usually does um yeah. but yeah that's also because half the people are in jail but more on that later uh <laughs> so before we say goodbye to uh, Sohas, sir, uh can we get a recommendation and please keep yours ready as well shruti well that's tough but since we are discussing bjp 
I would specifically recommend uh, this uh, biography of Atal Bihari Bashpai. Ah, very good. Chaudhary. Uh, in a sense, a contrast to the present leadership. Uh, but there are continuities between the BJP and Janasang of the earlier period and today's BJP. So, uh, let us not get uh, sort of uh, uh, carried away by the contrast. It is the continuity uh, within the party organization and its way of looking at Indian society, which are more important to me. And that's why I think we should be looking at that book very carefully, although the full biography is yet to be out. Yeah, yes. the, the, the second volume. Yes. Uh, so, yes. the, I don't know whether you know, but I'd like to boast. Ab- Abhishek used to be my colleague at News Laundry. He was, <laughs> he was a News Laundry nice. on our desk. Nice. So, you know, anyone who goes up and goes out and does something great usually has passed through News Laundry. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, very privileged to be here. <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah, in fact, he was here on, we did an interview on him based on his book, but I agree with you. It's fantastic, but I can't wait for the second. And and yeah, the so. amount of primary research he's gone through, I was like, dude, yeah. that must have been a lot yeah, of hard work. Absolutely. It's also sir. important in this sense that we can still write or he could still write the biography, the first part of the biography without eulogizing the uh, protagonist. Right. I don't know. Uh, in the future, historians would be and biographers would have that liberty to do that. Right. Yeah. Uh, and Shruti, your recommendation for our well, audience? I mean, I was very lucky to have endorsed the book. I wrote a blurb for it and I rec- read it for the press. I think it's easily one of my favorite all-time biographies across cultures. And uh, so huge congratulations to your former colleague. I mean, it may sound frivolous, but I am actually not going to recommend a book or even, I read a lot, but I'm going to recommend a series which may sound frivolous and it's running on Apple TV and it's called The New Look. And it is about Mm -hmm. Coco Chanel. I'm not into fashion at all. And it is about Coco Chanel, you know who she is, Chanel number five, and her... uh, time as a collaborator during the Vichy regime when France was taken over uh, by the Nazis. And, oh, interesting. Uh, and it's really what happened. And it, the, the film is, the series is really about her rivalry and the emergence of actually the post-war uh, Christian Dior, uh, who is part of the resistance, whose family is part of the resistance. And it is fascinating about how uh, French uh, couture, which was completely killed by the Nazis, revives itself by people who were members of the resistance. Now, like Balenciaga, these are all big brand names. We know them as, you know, uh, as, as that. And it's really a story of yeah collaborators with <laughs> during a dear and and there and and a very important cultural art of, uh, industry of uh, of France and how actually the bad times do end and there are people who have you know done some fascinating work to keep certain cultural and good things alive and it's a gripping drama it's an absolute gripping drama Juliette Pinoche really top actors in it. It's on Apple TV. Sorry to say right. this, but you know, no, so it makes me sound no, frivolous, no, it's, but it's no, really, good. really I, gripping. No, no, I, I think that's the whole idea of this this segment that we have on the, the Hafta where everyone gives a recommendation because we get very I'm definitely very kind watch. of recommendation. Often, you know, Anand will recommend, uh, you know, uh, Coffee with Karan's episode that he's thoroughly enjoyed. <laughs> or, no, I'm not going uh, that low. <laughs> 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 that, that was a joke. I, 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 <laughs> currently, I'm writing a very massive essay on the Indian constitution. So, I, you know, my mind that, is ne, ne, filled ne, with but, lots of that kind of stuff. But, but next time, rec- you, you so, should you should recommend the show that. Is so human about what happens when you live under authoritarian regime and you're trying to create hmm. for your creative industry and what happens, what happens to your friendships, what happens to people who have you know worked for the other side, as it were. And uh, so I recommend it. Thanks, Shruti. <laughs> Thank you, Suhas, sir. And hopefully, we will have you on the show uh, again. It's, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. And great to be in conversation with Thank Dr. Professor Palshakar and also to be back at News Laundry. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, you. Swas. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So now coming to the emails, we only enter the emails of subscribers. So if you have anything to say, you can click in the link below, uh, which opens up a little window and you can give your feedback there, which is a better way of doing it. You can also mail us directly at podcasts at newslaundry.com. I repeat, podcasts at newslaundry.com. But we'd prefer if you click on the link and do it in that way. I'll just read a few emails right now because the full gang isn't here. When Manisha's back and Jayashree's back, then we can do all those. But I'll read a few. We have 11 today. 
Uh, I will read maybe four, and the rest we will read when the whole panel is here, so we can answer more thoroughly. So Faraz says, "Why do NL Sina contributions result in my subscription being extended? I see regular subscription as means of showing ongoing support for your work, and NL Sina as a means of supporting a specific story that I find interesting. Instead of extending my subscription in lieu of Sina, may I suggest you convert them into gift subscription and distribute them to?" Distribute them to voting age students. I think most regular Sena contributors will find this agreeable. Good point, Faraz. I shall make a note of it right now, even as we speak, and immediately after we finish recording this, I shall take this suggestion and we shall implement it on all future NL Sena contributions. Then Pranil says, the last couple of weeks, panelists, mostly Abhinandan, have been talking about how most Delhi wale see the BJP to have finally crossed a line by arresting Kejriwal. But in Al Jazeera report, Shrinivas and Jain asked a bunch of people on the streets on what they thought, and most approved of the arrest, saying that "Aap should not worry if they haven't done anything wrong." One person went so far as to say that no one goes into politics without intentions of making money. This reminds me of Sudipto talking about how certain social groups can be apathetic and cynical. I wonder if the different response that Abhinandan Vasu received has to do with the caste and class, and would just like to know what you all think about it. Thank you for continuing to ring those in power in these trying times. So, uh, Pranil, you know, my observation is purely anecdotal. It's not really uh, data backed. Although I have skepticism on data backed polls, also you know my view on pre poll election polls and all that. So it was not. Uh, I mean, it's just observational. So it it doesn't have any, you know, authenticity or authority in the sense of how data would. Uh, that's my position. The more than the people are. Uh... If I speak about his arrest hmm. purely from the legal viewpoint, uh, they, he has been slapped with UAPA. But when you look at the evidences, the circumstantial evidence or the hmm. uh, so that is just uh, material evidence. There is no material evidence. Yeah, there is no paper so trail. So nothing, either. nothing has been considered. Sure. Just uh, slapping something on the basis of somebody who has made a once one sixty four. uh you know uh, uh, a statement under section 164 and and the the authorities are saying that this will be picked up whether it is credible or not this will be discussed at the time of the trial mm. so till the trial <laughs> let him be in the jail and uh, after that we'll discuss whether it is credible or not right uh, cyril says i disagree with manisha's view that we should vote for the mp we want to see represent us in the lok sabha and not look at the political party the anti defection law has made it almost impossible for individual mps to go against the party whip or dictate in fact every time india voted for a single party to a majority in parliament since the enactment of the anti defection law we essentially became a presidential system the only way to preserve the parliamentary form of democracy is to ensure that no single party gets a majority in the lok sabha a practical way to achieve this is by voting mps from regional parties to parliament that's So good thought, Sir. Like I agree with you. I'll just take one more email. This is from Inayat Khan. Inayat says, "Hello, NL Hafta team. Fan of your show. Love Manisha and Abhinandan. Question: Why did you guys stop reporting on farmers' protests? Were they already? They were already ignored by legacy media, but this time round, even digital media has ignored them. Is there a reason? Actually, very good uh, point, Inayat. Sir, I want to say I had gone to Punjab for those of our audience uh, for a function last weekend, and I drove there, and just before I got to Kharad. in punjab uh, the place i was going they said that you can't take the highway the farmers are sitting there it's blocked you know come by this way i said they still sitting here he said they've been sitting forever you don't do anything about it aapne coverage nahi ki you don't even you don't know legacy media is in, in, for exactly what i had said my friend told me on the phone so i i didn't even know but you know she's right he's right uh, that they've been sitting there and there's been absolutely no coverage uh, on them and that is why All these videos have emerged right? in Punjab that you not let us into Delhi, we will not let you into our village. So they had these cars with BJP flags. These guys stopped them, took out all the flags. Said you, we cannot enter Delhi. You will not enter Punjab. So it's uh, interesting, uh, but I think we should do a ground report from them yeah, because yeah. they're sitting of there course. by the thousands apparently. I, I didn't know that on the highway. I mean, I, I couldn't go there because the diversion is way before. But apparently, on the on there's a stretch. Where is the diversion? Uh, so just before Kharad, Mohali and Kharad, uh, I think Kharad is before Mohali. Okay. Just before that. Okay. Yes, we'll definitely do a story. <clears throat> so now for the recommendation of the week, uh, Anand, you want to go first? 
Okay, since uh, election uh, EVMs were discussed and elections in general were discussed, so uh, take from the other side of uh, the issue, uh, Naveen Chawla, the former um, chief election commissioner, his book, uh, The Story of Indian Elections, uh, it uh, also discusses EVMs and he bats for EVM from an administrative and logistic point of view and explains so it's just a version from the other side also uh, also because i don't like a lot of panic uh, while discussing things we, we get into panic his prose is very calm about it mm. and uh, in his explanation he is very calm also because he he is from an era which precedes this regime uh, he was election commissioner in around uh, 2009 10 so, mm. so that also adds uh, an value to that uh, version uh, second is a, a book that i started reading now it, it has just been released yesterday uh, salman rushdie's knife so oh how is it yeah i'm done so with it. i am not uh, i am just registering no, uh, it uh, that people take note of it because i would not recommend because i have not finished it, it for recommending you should uh, have finished the book so just few pages but it's uh, important because uh, uh, um so people like his writing or don't like um, they are divided about it but uh, just because of the period in which he wrote after the um, knife attack on him in august 2022 uh so it's uh, generally meditations about that only and he recounts the whole period his recovery period and how he took that you know, attack and a lot of details about that and uh, through that he draws some perspectives on of course uh, obviously the state of free speech today so that, so that's a, another one. interesting raman sir uh, my colleague basant kumar has done a wonderful story on uh, you know uh, which is uh, which the government claims the success story of 75000 farmers who whose income has doubled you know in the past 6 years or so so the the government indian council of agriculture research icar has come out with an official document of these 75000 farmers and they have given their pictures and they have given the amount of land that they hold and how they have doubled their income uh, you know in the past 6 years so basant kumar uh who is based in delhi he just goes to some neighboring areas he identifies he picks up these six seven farmers you know from the official record he visits them and he finds a different story altogether uh we can't even say that 99% uh lie it was 100% lie In some farmers did not even have the land and they their income have been shown you know as doubled and 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 uh, you know there's so many i mean each farmer has a different story to tell it's a video story so it it is more credible when you hear from the farmers so this is an ongoing story for us and we, we are doing going, other states uh, also we are going we'll we are going to go other. to other states as well and uh, we will also do the text stories on this uh, fabulous story and plus uh, our election coverage uh manisha is out uh, uh atul was had gone somewhere vasu is uh, yeah we doing a, a series shrinivas and jain like Shinivas i said and, and we want to do a lot more mm-hmm. journalists so yeah so 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 do check out election uh, coverage it's going to be right. it's going to be absolutely in the sheer scale that we are trying to accomplish this time we'll give legacy media which has a lot more resources run for their money without any corporate funding how about that only backed by you so do top up our funds So I have two recommendations. One is this. Uh, this is Singaporean channel. Ironically enough, not that Singapore has any local standard to talk about democracy and all, but it's a, a Singaporean channel called CNA Insider. Hmm. India's war on fake news. How disinformation became India's number one threat. It's alarming. A lot of this we already knew. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you knew. But just like the BBC documentary about Modi, when you see it all together <coughs> with one pattern and see the resources. it is alarming and worrying uh the second uh, article i would want to point out is quint's article poonam agarwal 
EVM vote count mismatch in 370 seats, uh, which the EC refused to explain. I think these are the kind of things that, you know, that kind of, for someone like me who was, who didn't have a position on it, I, I began to wonder. And uh, finally, I have a recommendation for our news channel anchors who were blown away by the Suraj uh, Tilak, Surya Tilak, uh, which I'm quoting one said, or Pradhan Mantri Narendra Modi ne apne aircraft mein dil par haath lakke, rakke, or apni sandal utar ke nange pair unhne ye video dekha. Kyunki agar dil pe haath rakke, or chappal pen ke dekh rahe to patani kuch aur video ka ho jata. Polluted. Or itna, matlab wo, they were so blown away by this technology. Ek kitab hai, Single Simple Science Experiments for Kids. What you can do with lenses and mirrors. Hum founders day pe karte the, see through the wall periscope hum wo tension water ka kya kehte hai surface tension ko leke kai hum patte ko swim karate the aapko dekhna chahiye aapko to bahut jadu lagega to mainstream media pe jo scientific temper promote ho raha tha usko dekh ke to i would so this book i am recommending to all our prime time anchors simple experiments for children based on science <laughs> on that note the song i don't know whether we've used it before or we haven't, but I think it's the season to use it again. It's a beautiful song. And Mitro in the trailer. Now we news laundry.